Hello and welcome to this preparational video for making clock dividers. I want to make this special episode before we do the clock dividers because in this episode we are going to look at binary counters and other CMOS circuitry. So this is really old logic circuitry that you can still buy and, and use of course and which is really good when working with modular and Arduino uh, because they work usually at 5 volts, they can work at 5 volts um, and higher uh, and it is ones and zeros but using old technology so I hope you already seen the video where with the party trick where I show you how to count to 31 on one hand because that knowledge will be good to have in this video. And these circuits can be used for so many things so I think that they I need to introduce them uh, in this one episode before we actually make a module out of them. Uh, so before we jump in and look at some of these circuits I want to say thank you to my Patreons who are supporting me and making it a bit easier for me to do these videos in my spare time. And with that uh, let's look at some basics uh, of CMOS and some very good circuits that we can use for making a clock divider. So CMOS ships is just a collection of the how they created the chips I guess but usually it is referred to as the, as logic chips CMOS 4000 there's a site called CMOS4000.com where you can find data sheets and information about almost all of the logic chips in the CMOS 4000 series. So the ones we are going to look at today are the 4017, 4024, 4040, 4516 and 4520. So let's begin with the 1417. So this is a decade counter with 10 decoded outputs and this is a bit special right off the bat because this doesn't count binary this counts uh, to 10 so it counts from 0 and then all the way up to 9 so it has it, it counts to 9 but it has 10 outputs on most of the chips on this site, there is this little nifty box where we can see what different pins do. L means low, X means whatever, H means high. These little symbols here means that whatever this thing here, next step, has happens on the rising edge of the poles or right here on the falling edge of the pulse. So this means that for it to move to the next step in this one, the clock needs to have a pulse and it goes when the pulse goes high and the enable and resets are low, we go to the next step. Nothing happens on the down pulse of the clock because that would mean that every pulse of the clock would move it forward two times but however if the clock is high and the enable pin goes from high to low then that is actually a next step too whatever the clock and enable pin is when the reset pin it goes high we clear all counters meaning in this case that the zero pin is high and one to nine is low now here are two important things when doing clock dividers. In this case, this is not so much a divider as a counter. It's important to know that if you want the clock to move forward on the 
rising edge or the falling edge. And you can change this around with an inverter, which I'll talk about a bit later. And also what you want the counter to do. So in this case, when we clear it, it actually has one pin high. Here is the 4017. We have power from an Arduino, nothing else. This is the clock pin and that is the reset pin. So as you can see, the output zero is lit. And when we press the reset button, that one is keeping is being kept lit. We have quite a few uh, one, oh, 1 mega ohm resistors here to pull all the pins to ground when not being pushed. However, these are not debounced. There is a really good way to debounce buttons which I've covered in a previous video which I really suggest you go and watch if you haven't done that already. It's using the uh, inverters of a 4106 uh, so and we can make use of that later on but for now I'm using non debounced buttons for except for the one mega ohm resistors here so it might be a bit jumpy but we move forward one clock and it goes to two and you see when I press it it moves forward press and when I release it <laughs> Usually nothing happens, but because it is non-debounced buttons, they are a bit uh, jittery. So again, pressing the button, moves forward, releasing nothing. Pressing, move forward, release. They really do like that. Yeah. But as you can see, this one is just moving forward. And when we get to the fourth pin, what I've done is on the fifth pin is just a cable connected to reset. So when it goes to pin five, it resets and lights up pin zero again. The second one is the 4027 seven stage binary counter, which, in, which works the same as the 4040 12 bin. 12-bit asynchronous binary counter. But let's start to look at the 4024. It's a bit more simple logic diagram here. On the rising edge, uh, reset is low, no change. On the falling edge, reset is low. That is the next step. So on the 4024, the next step is made on the falling edge. So in our case, when we... Let go of the button or when whichever clock pulse goes low. And when you put the re set the reset pin high, all outputs go low. So that means all outputs will be zero. Not as in the 4017 where output zero is actually high. And the 4040 is the same on the rising edge, no change. On the falling edge, next step and reset pin high, all outputs low. One of the differences here is it has 12 bits output. The 4024 only have seven. So on the left side here, we have the 4040. Uh, you can disregard this on the right a bit. And so when we press the reset, all pins are low and when we proceed the clock one step one step so I press it down and when I release it that's when the clock goes forward and here you can see the binary counting doing its thing so here we have the clock divider circuit that we are looking for so, one, two, three, so that the first one is divided by two, the second one is divided by four, the third one is divided by eight, and the fourth one is divided by 16. Moving on to 
4520. So this is a dual synchronous binary counter. We only have four bits out in each counter, but instead we have two counters in one chip, so we could make a module with two four bit counters. The reason I want to show this also, this also is a binary clock that counts on the rising edge. Enable, that's an interesting pin as well because with that we can actually have a small switch which actually stops the counting. And let's look at that in action. Again disregard the rightmost and the 4520 is the one on the left. So when we reset it all outputs are zero and then we press down and that's when the first bit is lit and releasing does nothing and then the second one and the two fourth uh, third bit fourth bit and resetting puts them all back to zero the 4516 is even more special because this is a binary up down counter so this one actually depending on the up down pin pin 10 if that is high or low it will count upwards or downwards in binary form and it also has a little thing called program pins so you have P0 to P3 and when using them along with the load command here load pin I'm guessing that you can I haven't done this so guesswork here you can have specific places in the count that you can jump directly to by using these programming pins. With logic circuitry we can make very many interesting things. So now we have a binary counter here which is doing what it's supposed to do and counting binary and dividing the the input signal to as many outputs as we'd like or as much as whichever chip we're using can handle so the 4520 in this case but as I said with the inverter so we need when we're doing a real circuit later on we'll need the 4106 the chip over here uh, to debounce the two buttons but that this one has six inverters in it and that means that after the two buttons are debounced we still have four inverters left and we can use one inverter to change the clock from acting on the rising edge to the falling edge or vice versa by connecting the clock through a uh, inverter the whenever we press the button and we get a step forward on the clock divider. We can change that behavior by connecting it through an inverter. And now, instead of counting on the rising edge, we are counting on the falling edge. So that is one good reason to have a 4106. A third way of using inverters and the 4106 is to get the offbeat of all the clocks. So down here we have the offbeat of the clock, the input clock, and the offbeat of the third bit, which I had to move down here with a resistor. Uh, you need resistors to limit the current. So when I press down here, uh, the, the clock is high which means that the offbeat of the clock is low. Releasing also, yeah, it counts a bit strange here, that's okay. But as you can see, uh, now we have the third bit is high and then the offbeat of the third bit is low. 
So those two are the offbeat of each other, and that's the offbeat of the clock. And this is once again to to get other useful divisions and half divisions really uh, with the offbeat. One final thing to mention when working with clock dividers is that with clock dividers done from binary counters they all are a factor of divided by 2 so divided by 2 divided by 4 divided by 8 and so on uh, if we want other divisions than that then there's a few circuits we can use and I'm going to show the AND gate uh, so the AND gate is looks like this uh, the symbol for it is like that and it has two inputs A and B and one output Y and if A is high and B is high then Y is high any other combination Y is low and so I've added a 4081 to the 4040 here and it is connected so one of so there's four and and gates in this one and the inputs are connected to pin 1 and pin 2 so that is the AND pin of those two so when both of these are lit that one will also be lit so we could add this as another output so 1 2 and now that one is lit 3 Three, let's see, oh, we jumped here. But so what happens now if I manage to get one more? There. So it's not only the third one, it's every one where both one and two are lit that that one is lit. So it does, I believe it is three, seven, and eleven. I think those are the numbers. But so having a uh, 4081 is also good to have to have a few more divisions to choose from. There are many other kinds of gates, of course, or, NAND, XOR, NOR, NOT, uh, NOT we've had, that's the 4106. But so we've, we've used two in this examples today and there are many more that we can use. And just to show that it actually works with as a musical device and not only to blink LEDs. So there's a clock in here and two of the divisions go out. The green cables. <coughs> so the clock comes from the 4046, which is split. So you're supposed to hear the click. That's that's the clock, and then we have the other two divisions here. So that's that one. And then the second one goes into the VCO and just We've got rhythm that keeps the beat. And in the next episode we will make a whole module out of everything we learned today. So technically with this knowledge you can now sit down and make a clock divider that out of the box actually works in a modular synthesizer. I've tried this one, there's no extra on the board. There are two push buttons, not debounced that correct way, which I talked about with the inverters. Um, even have some LEDs. I ran this from the power supply of an Arduino, which means it runs at 5 volts. The LEDs 
take a lot of current and uh, so and the voltage drops to around two volts out but that was enough to to trigger most of my of the modules in my modular it is however not enough to trigger most modules in most modulars I guess so uh, in the next episode we will actually make a clock divider for real there are some extra circuitry uh, on the outputs and inputs to protect everything and make it play well with other modules. A good thing again with the CMOS circuits is that they can, most of them can run from around 2 to 2.5 volts up to 20 volts. So any modular you have is if be it 12 volts, 15 volts uh, or just 9 volts some of you have that or if it's more of a 5 volt system with Arduinos and stuff you can use the CMOS circuits and, and they play well on, with all these uh, voltages. And as I said, I, I, I powered this from my Arduino and added a really hot signal of around 12, 10 volts into it to the trig input. I wanted to see if it broke. It didn't. It probably might in the long run, but it didn't in the short run. And I played around with it a bit. Uh, so it's very forgiving circuitry that way they they and and most of the chips have buffers built in so that's also a good thing but more on that in the next episode i hope you like this and that you actually learned something of all the ramblings about these logic circuits and it's it's another rabbit hole you can fall down into and just start making really strange modules. I believe there's a whole subsection of modular syn synthesis called Lunetta, which is dedicated to working with CMOS ships and, and making module, modular modules out of those chips. So maybe have a look at that. Like, subscribe, bell and all that. Leave a comment with things that you think that we should do with a CMOS chip of any kind. And I'll see you in the next episode. Take care. Bye.